say have power, and I'm, we can cuss and discuss as long as you like. In fact, if I have power by clock, we can go on beyond that. Uh, a number of people have come to me asking, well, when am I going to talk about the Ku Klux Klan? And I say, well, May 1st. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's like that. I suggested that we could entertain such questions here and now, but uh, they said no, they would wait. Uh, I, I referred to my notes during intermission and uh, found a couple of things I thought I would pass along before we go into questions. Uh, one is under the heading of uh, recent developments in the field of oral history is what I suppose is being called or ought to be called uh, the collective oral history in which uh, you tell the history of an entire community by pulling together oral histories from members of that community. And um, one such uh, volume which has come to my hand is, is titled Pearl City Remembers. And uh, Gary, do you know, is Pearl City, is that the uh, uh, southeast Florida? I think, I think it's around Boca Raton. Boca Raton. Anyway, it's a very effective uh, piece of work in which they talk to all sorts of people in Pearl City, uh, an Afro-American community uh, squeezed out by expressways and so on. They're relocated by expressways, really. And uh, it turned out to be a very effective way of telling telling what happened, as I said earlier. Um, so the second thing I don't even recall, and so we'll go right into questions. Perhaps I will into the into the I don't think I told you in the first session about the, uh, this is just, I uh, said I was short of laughs today, but let me tell you, did I, I didn't tell you about the Seminole, Black Seminole, who acted as translator. Those of you who were here on the first session. So the one of the runaway slaves who had come down from the Virginia to the Carolinas and uh, taken up with the Seminole to learn the language, it was called upon to uh, uh, translate for powwow with the generals who were trying to move the Seminoles to Oklahoma. And uh, they came in under a, a flag of truce. And uh, this chieftain arose and spoke for more than an hour, with tears streaming down his face about Florida being his own. He didn't want to go to Oklahoma. And uh, they had prearranged with the Black Seminole to uh, do the translating. And all during the, the Seminole's uh, long talk, uh, the former slave was sitting at the campfire turning a possum or something on a spit and taking taking good care of his roast possum and seemingly paying no attention to what was being said. But in any case, when they finished, the general said, all right, now what did he say? And uh, the black Seminole, <clears throat> without even looking up from his possum, said, says he ain't going. <laughs> Of course, the general says, I got to have more than that. I, I need to know everything the man said. He said, said he ain't going. <laughs> so it's another example, as I see it, of the ability of the folk to say a, a lot in a few words and they're not given to verbosity. I uh, was reminded, too, by I was at an international conference once somewhere in Europe, and along the French speaker, I guess, spoke for 20 minutes, it seemed like, and uh, then the translator, uh, they had translators of various languages. The Mongolian translator got up and said, blah, 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 blah. He said, he spoke for about 30 seconds and sat down. Everyone was looking around. Well, why, you know, that's not fair. You didn't, but someone raised the question, said, did you tell him everything he said? He said, yeah, the Mongolian language is like that. We do, it doesn't take many words. So apparently that's, that's uh, language is different in that respect. The, uh, Ideograph uh, mode of uh, speaking and writing, I guess, is, is uh, more uh, efficient. Anyway, yes. Uh, you interviewed quite a few ex slaves, I gather. Yes. And I, was, what, I noticed a number of them felt they were better off as slaves than they were after the emancipation or their so called freedom. I wonder to what extent was that true, and was there any time in, in our history? Of course, many were not alive, I assume, and we had the civil rights uh, 
boom in the 60s. Was there any time when that feeling changed, do you feel? Well, uh, we were blessed or cursed <coughs> with state directors of these writers' projects who uh, had certain sentiments on, on the subject and were inclined to say to the field staff that, uh, you know, see if you can't find some kindly masters, you know. Surely in Florida, surely in Florida uh, they were mostly kindly. And uh, so we had orders to, to sort of look hard for such uh, stories. And to the extent that white interviewers were questioning black ex-slaves, there was that uh, uh, unspoken intimidation in, in the inquiry of, of white on black. And that's why I tried to make it just insofar as possible black on black interviews in the hope of getting more of the real truth. Um, there were slaves, uh, it's true, who said uh, uh, things like, uh, said, I, I worked hard then, but, said, I, but I always had to work hard to live. And I think that summed up the, the fact of the matter that uh, they had worked hard under slavery, that's true, but in 1935, they were still working very hard to live. And that's all they got out of it. It was like the Russian stories about it. it didn't make much difference whether you were in camp or out. You, you lived on borscht soup and black bread. And uh, that was the same sort of situation. Um, there, there was plenty of, of uh, I don't know how, uh, up near Jacksonville, for example, the king's of the plantation. He built his own ships and brought over slaves and uh, bred them and educated them and trained them in vocations and sold them and uh, had uh, any number of uh, wives. He married an African woman, uh, a tribal custom, and had any number of children and left a will saying, uh, whereas I know it's against the conventions and laws of this country, black and white, and so forth, whereas I don't give a damn. Um, Say, I hereby acknowledge so and so are my children. I want my estates to be divided among them. But uh, in, in that case, I recall an instance in which uh, one of the uh, slaves, a young girl, had been eavesdropping at the big house, and the, the black mistress uh, called for the plantation carpenter and ordered him to nail the girl's ear to the side of the house as a lesson to not to eavesdrop. Um, you keep running into things like uh, <coughs> uh, putting a slave in a barrel and driving nails into the barrel and rolling it down a hill. So that uh, I was never much taken by the stories about the kindly masters. It was too much of that other. Uh, that's about all I can say in the way of an answer to that question. No. Uh, in cases of atrocities <coughs> like that, no. and in general where you have a historical event where the only history is oral history, how do you evaluate oral histories as a source of actual fact and information as opposed to feeling? You know, Okoye or Rosewood would be a good example. Well, as I said earlier, one has to take into account if the person was a victim or a participant, uh, you can expect a, a certain uh, uh, subjective attitude toward what happened to being rolled down a hill in a barrel. Uh, but but you somebody have, you have to come out with an attitude. Uh, so that uh, I don't really know the answer to the question. I said I think we have to be equally uh, diligent and seeking the truth both in the, from the professional and the participant, uh, from, from their respective uh, uh, axes to, to be ground and so forth. So I'm inclined to, to pay a lot of attention when someone tells it, tell it from a first-hand point of view. Uh, the element of distortion, the possible distortion is there, but it can be discounted and evaluated. Uh, in the case of footnotes, uh, you've got to look farther in, in terms of seeing how many biases you're dealing with. And, uh, uh, the one thing about the, the 
that's what testimony is. At least it's not a compounded bias, and you get into the footnotes and you've got compounded bias. But can you do anything? Do you have a methodology like uh, comparing two or three different oral histories of the same incident or anything like that? Yeah, I, I don't know whether you were here when I described how Alan Burns at the University of Florida has developed a technique where he uh, puts uh, several informants into an informal situation with no uh, interviewer in sight and uh, not even the mic in sight and let them uh, unravel uh, the tale among themselves and to serve as a counterbalance and, and critiquing what each one is saying. And that's proved to be very effective. Yes? Isn't one of the problems of history that whether it is written or oral, that too many times the <coughs> general public will take one account as the prevalent situation? rather than, as you say, balancing different ones? I don't know. I guess we're blessed in, in this country with not having what's called uh, official histories. Uh, so many countries, uh, when you have uh, any form of authoritarian or totalitarian uh, regime, uh, you get official histories as to what happened. And in this country, uh, we uh, pretty free in terms of having an avalanche of interpretations, so that even the physical task of evaluating all the, the uh, varied and conflicting accounts of a single event is a momentum, monumental task of, of going through the avalanche. Um, I don't know. Um, well, it's a strange period we're living in. On the one hand, we've, we've got USA Today and this encapsulated, trivialized uh, treatment of, of what's happening in the world. And that's just a random citation, and nothing really against USA Today, but it's uh, abbreviated uh, look at the world and what's happening. And on the other hand, things like the internet uh, blossoming and uh, proliferation of an infinite amount of, of stuff out there de detached, provided you have the equipment. So that between those uh, two trends of, of uh, abbreviation on the one hand, encapsulation and trivialization, you're getting this uh, uh, saturating the, uh, the airwaves or wherever this material is stored in Virginia or wherever. Um, don't, I don't know what the end result of that's going to be. We uh, still have an enormous section of the population in, in I gather which does not uh, habitually have books in the home, uh, or magazines, in some cases newspapers. So you've got segments of the population in, in that uh, predicament. And uh, again, I don't know what those trends are. I'm going to leave the trends in the 21st century to you. Uh, <laughs> the 20th is quite enough for me. <laughs> come across any good trends, call me collect them. <laughs> but those are trends certainly that are, are going to shape the future of the species and the planet and what, what the outcome will be, particularly if we don't do much about it. I hinted in my first session, I think, something about freedom of speech and the phenomenon. <laughs> yes, we, so we've got it, but what, what have we got to say? That's part of the question. That whether or not we've been fixed is not that old. Uh, <clears throat> looking back into your family, are there writers uh, or scholars in your in your background, your family tree? How did you get to be how like you are? <laughs> I didn't mean that to be a person. <laughs> you know, they weren't clones. <laughs> uh, the answer is by dropping out. <laughs> um, I say that only half seriously. Uh, uh, Tolstoy, I think, I don't know if I said that at the first session or not, but Tolstoy uh, felt the same way that uh, if you wanted to really discuss something serious, you would go to the illiterate peasants to do it because their thinking and speaking hadn't been obfuscated by formal, too much formal training. So, so that, uh, 
I have that in common with you know, this uh, feeling that the, the profundity and looking at life and analyzing life was to be found more often in such circles sometimes than in others. Uh, the, the answer to your question, I, I don't know what uh, what the real answer is. Um, when I dropped out of the University of Florida, it was because I felt the world was about to go up in flames, which it did, and that the university wasn't paying attention. And uh, of course, the world's in flames right now. And, uh, and I think I mentioned in the first session Russell Means, the American Indian movement leader who got up at FSU and, and began his remarks by saying, here in this center of, of uh, white brainwashing. <laughs> so all, all that involved my personal family background. Uh, I went on to do some formal study at, at the, the New School in Manhattan and uh, at the Sorbonne, but uh, not as much as I should have. And in the, person, in the family background, there was, uh, I don't know what the situation in those generations was, you know, there were an awful lot of people who had college education my parents' time. My mother kept telling me that two of my ancestors signed the Declaration of Independence, for example. That's about all. <laughs> well, they were educated, each person of education, I suppose. Uh, to sign the Declaration had to be people of property, I would imagine, and being people of property, property implies education. Describe the, the Cross City account in 1939. You yeah. were with Zora Neale Hurston. Right. She was packing a revolver she was afraid for her life. Uh, were you ever afraid of going in some of these turpentine camps and in, in isolated counties and did you pack a revolver? And just, I'd, I'd be curious to hear more accounts of, of uh, some of the interviews with wood riders and uh, these offbeat characters you encountered in the, in the 1930s. And how, you, how did you find out about some of these obscure characters? Did you just stumble upon a turpentine camp or did someone tell you you need to talk to X I, my instructions to the field workers were to the effect that uh, it, would, it was uh, profitable mm -hmm. to in entering any community, whatever the ethnicity or culture, uh, to sound out, inquire, make inquiry as to who was considered to be the, the leader of the community, uh, whether spiritual or sometimes it would be a preacher or sometimes a, a voodoo doctor or a midwife or a teacher. But uh, those were the categories which usually had the leadership influence in their hands. And we would go and sell them, tell them what we're up to, and uh, sell them on the proposition. So that uh, thenceforth, we, the field worker was in a position to say, well, I've already talked to Sister So-and-so, and, and she thinks this is a great idea, and if you got any questions, you can ask her about it. And, uh, you know, and that paved the way and made it uh, open a lot of doors. So almost invariably we did it, made contacts that way, and I referred to what I called ambulatory repositories uh, before, and pointed out to the field workers that they would probably find one or more such people who had taken it upon themselves uh, to serve that function in every community where they, where they went. If they could look for them, they could find them, and it would save them a lot of time getting a piecemeal. But there were these individuals who were just saturated with it, and uh, that was the thing to do. Uh, Bobby Billy, the question was asked earlier, I'm, I'm reminded about the Seminole uh, culture. I made friends with a uh, traditional Seminole named Bobby Billy, and it was he who walked recently from the Everglades to Tallahassee uh, on a Save the Earth proposition. He goes around speaking with the Florida road maps uh, and pointing all these lines on the Florida map and saying, this, this is where the problem is. This, these, these lines are road, and they're keeping the water from going where it wants to go. And uh, I thought that was one way to put it. You know, it, it certainly had a point there that there weren't enough holes under those roads to let the water go where it wanted to go. And uh, Bobby Billy tells me that he was very deliberately chosen as a child to become the, the tra 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 tradition keeper for his group that the existing incumbent uh, spiritual leader, together with the tribe, the entire tribe, 
kept a sharp eye on the children, seeking out the one child who would be named to be the successor of the repository for the, for the cause. And I thought that was an interesting fact of life. What, what, what was the other part of the question? No. The danger uh, you, you may have faced in some of these uh, turpentine camps. Uh, uh, and did um, you ever carry a... Uh, yeah, I was living uh, in, in recent times in, in Mandarin, Florida, in St. John's County. And when I, someone mentioned the <coughs> Ku Klux Klan, uh, Leonard Hartley, uh, the proprietor of the uh, corner uh, crossroads store, Said, we don't need the Klan. And uh, I understood him to be saying that we've got them in their place and, and the, the, the Klan's not necessary. And I think that was generally the case in the state of Florida and much of the, most of the South uh, in the 30s. That uh, it was not the blacks we, anyone had to fear in going into turpentine camps, but uh, the, the Klan element and the, uh, the boss man, the witch rider. Uh, it's true that the camp proprietors kept, uh, or the, the woman who had inherited uh, this large uh, turpentine operation in Cross City uh, packed a revolver, and uh, she kept uh, loaded rifles and shotguns stacked by the front door, and I suppose with some reason. But uh, uh, generally speaking, if a black even tried to leave the place, uh, she just called it and he would blockade the roads and uh, intercept the person and uh, if by chance the person escaped uh, the camps would hold the wife and children and furniture if any as hostage until they recaptured the fellow and brought him back to New York. Of course they were saying all the time that they were in debt and therefore not entitled to leave in debt and uh, that's the way that thing worked. Uh, I don't recall ever feeling any such uh, fear. I'll be telling some stories about Zora and uh, how she hunted up the men in these camps and she, <laughs> they gave her a reason to fear for another reason. She had to keep her car running, so to speak. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, no, I'm not, not, I was not aware of any such uh, concern. Uh, it, it's very true that in, in the turpentine camps in particular, where peonage and the commissary system were uh, reign supreme, that uh, uh, when I would be talking, uh, I would tell the boss that I was looking for songs, but when I, the boss wasn't there and I started switching to life history, uh, then the people themselves took it upon themselves to post centuries uh, to see whether the wood rider was, you know, serve notice. But I'll talk more about that next, at the next session. Uh, hope, hope many of you can be there. We're going to have uh, my colleague Ivy Bigby. We taught oral history at, at UN uh, last fall, a team thing, uh, teaching students to do it themselves. And as I was showing them documentary photography techniques. Um, we put together uh, over a hundred, uh, the most extensive collection of uh, photographs and visuals on Zora Hurstel, which I begin to produce. Uh, we'll be showing it in this next session. Yes. Um, what do you think, if you're aware of Anna DeVere Smith's work uh, as a kind of hybrid of oral history, what do you think of it as a technique? Whose work? Anna DeVere Smith. Uh, not sure I knew that one. What what is it? What is it? She does theater pieces, if you will, in which she uh, does all the people she's interviewed essentially as a series of monologues. I think the best known one was a piece that went on PBS called uh, about the uh, Crown Heights riots a couple of years ago and uh, Fires in the Mirror, I think it was. Yeah. I'm not familiar with it, but as a technique, I, I think it has a contribution. Mr. Candy, I'm, I'm wondering, um, your feelings about human rights, did you have those strong feelings before you got into the oral history work, or did it develop 
and become stronger as you interview the people? I don't know. The 30s are, were, you know, the, spoke about hard times in the first session. And they were indeed hard, and a lot of people were suffering. And uh, including the Wall Street brokers jumping out of their skyscrapers. And so everybody was suffering in their own ways. And it was uh, difficult, uh, as far as I'm concerned, for a child to, to come into that kind of environment, a situation in which you could see suffering uh, on every street, on every corner. Uh, it was inescapable because the hunger and the, the fear and the insecurity were, were everywhere. And uh, so it, that made an impression, no doubt. And the, the fact that the uh, African uh, Floridian was uh, suffering most of all, there was another inescapable fact that uh, keeping insult on injury with the Jim Crow system, uh, blacks. There were many whites as poor and as hungry as blacks, but uh, on top of that, uh, we were calling them names and uh, giving them a hard time, uh, you know. Uh, the, the, the black situation struck me as being the most gross uh, and uh, insufferable of injustices that we had going. And there were so many of them that could count them. So I suppose the, the times had a lot to do with it. And, Without saying we're not just talking about the 30s, there are a lot of hard times out there right now uh, in this country and many other countries. So those conditions continue to exist, and for all I know, they may be getting worse rather than better. And how to make them better is I've been looking for answers all my life, and I'm not sure what I've found. So if more students here, I would say that's your problem. Hey, I uh, wanted to make a comment on uh, uh, oral history and, and writing your family history. Uh, uh, learning in retirement, uh, many of those uh, of our members are here. Uh, we, we do have two courses coming up again, uh, uh, an oral history course and uh, one in writing your family history. So if you're interested, uh, coffee, the LIR coffee takes place on the 7th of March, uh, next Friday, 10 o'clock at the Public Health Auditorium. Yeah, I'm glad, glad you said all that because uh, it reminds me that there may be some things in the experience that uh, Ivy and I had at UNF last fall, and it was an honors program for some 30 students. And uh, they, we allowed them to elect, uh, decide which group of people, occupational group or ethnic group, they wanted to uh, interview. And they chose fisher folk, uh, commercial fishermen. And uh, so we put them through a semester of uh, training, if you please, on how to, how to take oral history, how not to take oral history, especially. And uh, uh, the results were astounding, in my opinion. Uh, at the end of the, uh, before the term ended, we turned them loose and let them go into the field on their own, and uh, the results were, were very uh, significant, in my opinion. Uh, and they began, as you apparently are doing, by doing a family history. And we had students come back and report to the class that, that I did grandmother or mother or somebody and said, I've been living with these people 18 years and did nothing about it. <laughs> and, uh, they, were, they were, you know, it, it served as a family cement or a getting together, togetherness thing you know, that uh, apparently social workers and, and uh, uh, people concerned with the family uh, status and values uh, ought to explore you left a great potential in terms of getting acquainted with your parents and vice versa. I, I recall even the problem of uh, the other team teacher said, well now what what would you what, what should you wear in the field? <laughs> Her first thought she just knew.
do the oral history, but maybe you better get some khaki or something. <laughs> <laughs> and you girls had better not be at all provocative or revealing. <laughs> <laughs> so I intervened and said, no, said your students, and you don't want them taking your mosquito control or something. <laughs> 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 so uh, just your students that look like students and, and leave it that way. The other techniques that we discussed uh, in preparing them for field work, um, let me see, what did we tell them? Uh, for one thing, uh, that it was not a quiz, you know, when were you born and where your parents' name and where did you go to school, to, to avoid the census approach to oral history and to simply try to get them talking and enthused and to use the instant playback as a tool to get them excited about hearing their own voices and talking about their own things. That uh, these, these most reticent the informant would, upon hearing themselves uh, on the tape, uh, become ham actors and then on how you can't stop them. You know? and, uh, so that worked. And that was something we discovered as far back as 35 with our big machine. And, uh, did say to them that uh, I could try to get this group discussion technique going. That's one thing. And interacting one with the other, talking one another, reminding one another. And also the importance of the uh, interviewer to react to what was being said. Uh, to, you know, to a lot of cooling now and, and not being passive or, uh, you know, to really get in, into the subject matter to be impressed with what was being said. It just, just made a difference. And um, they think it, it, it all worked very nicely. Any